passage we will be considering tonight is Revelation 5, so if you would open your Bibles to that chapter. This is God's holy, inerrant, infallible, and inspired word. Let us give attention to its reading. Then I saw in the right hand of him who is seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign in the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this glimpse, as it were, into the heavenly throne room. We thank you for this chance to see what the destination of all of human history is the Lamb worthy because he was slain. We pray that as we consider this passage tonight, you will show us our unworthiness and his supreme worthiness and lead us in praise. In Jesus' name, amen. This passage cannot be understood without understanding the beginning. It's very easy to skip to the end of the passage to focus solely upon the praise of the Lamb to dwell only on those words which inspired Handel's mighty chorus. But the words can only be grasped when first we have realized the unworthiness of the creature. Chiaroscuro, the striking contrast of light and dark, is as vital to theology as it is dazzling in the world of art. In chapter 4, John had entered the throne room of the kingdom of heaven to see the Lord God Almighty seated in dominion, to find the multitudes of heaven bowing down and praising him, ceaselessly engaged in glorification. Now he sees this God, the Lord of the universe, the Lord of time, holding a scroll. What is this document? What does it mean? What does it contain? Interestingly enough, we are never told exactly what the scroll is in the book of Revelation. Some have identified it with a scroll mentioned in Ezekiel 2. In that passage, the contents of the scroll are said to be words of lamentation and mourning and woe. 
However, the scroll in Ezekiel is probably not identical to the one here, because Ezekiel is told to eat the scroll, whereas this scroll is never eaten in the book of Revelation. Because of that, Ezekiel's scroll may be more parallel to the different smaller scroll that John does eat later in the book. G.K. Beale has pointed out a better connection between this scroll and two chapters of the prophet Daniel. In Daniel 7, we read this. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. This language of the books being opened seems to parallel this scroll, which can be translated book, which is opened here in Revelation. Indeed, that seems to be likely because the scroll here, as it is opened, causes the judgment of the earth, similar to the scene in Daniel. Therefore, the scroll is one of judgment. Daniel 12 also shed some light on a different aspect of the scroll. There we read, I heard, but I did not understand. So I said, O my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. In this sense, then, the scrolls conceal the hidden things. Every mystery of providence, every forecast of the future is kept in the scroll, and therefore the opening of the scroll is an act of revealing. So, here we have the Lord of the universe holding the plan of time. Here we have, as it were, the hidden veil of history, lacking only the hand to draw it aside, the chest of secrets, lacking only the key to unlock it. For the great assertion of this text is that there is no one worthy to understand the direction of history. There is no one who is capable of judging mankind and bringing about the establishment of heaven. The prediction of world events, the desire to read the past in order to understand the future, the penchant to produce grand narratives for history, has been a human effort since the beginning of time. Virgil and his Aeneid presented the empire of Rome as the ultimate purpose of the gods, the destiny of the human race. This conception of history was so important to the ancients that even many Christians imbibed it. Jerome, the great Bible translator, wrote when Rome fell that he had to work hard not to despair of God's mercy. Here is a man, even a Christian man, who read Rome as in some way central to history. Rome was the sad story of the scroll. Others have conceived of the past as the story of great men, so-called monumental history of world historical men and world historical peoples. In this view, there are a few who are worthy to open the scroll. Supermen who tower above the conceptions of their age. Men whose vast insight or influence somehow qualifies them to guide the course of history. Winston Churchill, whom some would credit with being one of these men himself, wrote, We want a monarch peak with base enormous, whose summit is forever hidden in the clouds. He hit upon the innate human desire to look up at Mount Sinai and find a great man upon it, someone who is fundamentally like us. So much of our modern discontent with the past is precisely because we have found that our great men are not, after all, worthy to open the scroll. But even more innate to human desire is the desire to find ourselves worthy. Every human being who has ever lived wants to shape his destiny in some way. Why else are we so concerned with what other people think about us? Why else are we so stupidly frustrated, even angry, when things don't go the way we planned. Why do we spend so much of our lives 
and daydreams about hypothetical futures centering on ourselves so unlikely to come to pass. Isn't this why we find it so hard to sin? Thy way, not mine, O Lord, however dark it be, lead me by thine own hand, choose out the path for me. Yet here we read, no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. No one, not the greatest government ever set up, not the greatest man ever to live, not even you yourself. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. Who then could be worthy? Look again at verses 5 and 6. Isn't it amazing the words we have here? John is told, the lion of the tribe of Judah, a fearsome warrior king, is able to open the scroll. At last, here is the mightiest of these world historical men, the most marvelous superhero, the ultimate and greatest conqueror. Or so John might have assumed. He was told that it was someone prior to, and thus even more important than David himself. Who could it be? And John turned, not to find a lion, but to find a lamb. More than that, a lamb who had been slain. All of biblical history points towards this moment. In the book of Genesis, we see a wizened father and his young son, the hope of many decades toiling the road to Mount Moriah. Abraham, who had been promised to be the father of many nations, has been ordered to kill his son, his only son from Sarah. As they approach the altar of sacrifice, where blood must be shed. Isaac turns to his father and asks, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham, who believed God so that it was counted to him for righteousness, said, God will himself provide the lamb for a burnt offering. When Israel was enslaved in Egypt, oppressed for centuries, they were without hope until Moses arose and God used him to lead them out of Egypt. One night the Lord commanded them to prepare to flee. They did not even have time to leaven the bread in their ovens. They were thrust out. The Bible says they could not wait to journey in the wilderness for 40 years. This act, so pivotal in the history of Israel, was to be celebrated yearly. And this is how it's to be done. We read in the book of Exodus. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. And so, as the people of Israel killed their lambs while darkness covered the earth, they commemorated the moment when they were set free. Nor was a lamb only to be used in the celebration of Passover. It was part of the regular sacrificial system of the Israelites. We read in Leviticus chapter 4, If he brings a lamb as his offering for a sin offering, he shall bring a female without blemish and lay his hand on the head of the sin offering, and kill it for a sin offering in the place where they killed the burnt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him, for the sin which he has committed, and he shall be forgiven. The symbolism was again confirmed in the great passage of the prophet Isaiah, where this lamb's sacrifice clearly stands in the place of our own sin. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, 
and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. On the innocent land, who could not defend himself before his accusers, our transgressions were laid. The entire story of salvation from the book of Genesis through Exodus, from the law through the prophets, pointed to the fact that the Lamb was Christ. But for those who might be slow of hearing and dull of heart, as we so often are, the Gospels themselves made clear the symbolism. When Jesus approached John the Baptist, asking to be baptized, we read this. The next day he, that is John, saw Jesus coming before him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself do not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed in Israel. The whole purpose of John's existence was to reveal that, the Christ, that Christ was the Lamb. We note again only a few verses later. John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus and he walked, as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Seeing Jesus as the Lamb became the call for his disciples. So it is today. Jesus is the Lamb, and this is the call for all his disciples. For that is clearly what we see here in Revelation's description of heaven. Disciples proclaiming the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. For the Lamb is indeed worthy. He it is who has borne our sins his body on the tree. Why was he also called a lion? I want briefly to quote Jonathan Edwards in his magnificent sermon on this text with his thought. Thus Christ appeared at the same time and in the same act as both a lion and a lamb. He appeared as a lamb in the hands of his cruel enemies as a lamb in the paws and between the devouring jaws of a roaring lion. Yea, he was a lamb actually slain by this lion. And yet at the same time, as the lion of the tribe of Judah, he conquers and triumphs over Satan, destroying his own devourer, as Samson did the lion that roared upon him. And in nothing has Christ appeared so much as a lion, in glorious strength, destroying his enemies, as when he was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. In his greatest weakness, he was most strong. And when he suffered most from his enemies, he brought the most confusion upon his enemies. That lamb, that lamb, previewed through the whole of the Bible, is here in Revelation revealed as the one who is most worthy. The response to this lamb, to the worthiness of Christ, is the praise of all creation. This is the application of our text, and I want to spend the rest of our time considering it. Look again at the progression from verse 8 through the end of the chapter. At first, the circle of praise around the throne of God extends only to a small band, the four living creatures, those terrifying beings described already in the book of Revelation, combine with the 24 elders to bow before the throne and cry, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. Then, moving down, all of the angels cry. Doubtless many of the same ones who proclaimed his birth, saying, Glory to God in the highest. They cry, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain, to receive power and wealth, and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Here we have not merely the leaders of Israel, not merely this small chosen band of elders who are privileged to sit next to the throne itself, but as it were, we have looked up from the war room of the Lord of hosts, and we see radiating out from the light of the glory of God into the furthest reaches 
of those heavenly halls, a mighty throng numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Awesome singing praise. That's not all. For then, we see every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And all that is in them, crying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Here is the truly indescribable. For in every jungle of the Amazon, every snow-capped mountain in the Alps or the Himalayas, the Surrealian seas and tropical shoals, there comes a symphony of songs which words cannot express. Every creature. And that means a giraffe. That means an elephant swaying with his trumpeting trunk. That means an undiscovered species of ant in a Peruvian rainforest. All of them are crying out, worthy is the Lamb. This praise, my friends, is the telos of creation. Samuel Rutherford, the great Scottish minister of the 17th century, was a man who knew how to express the praise of Christ. In his own inimitable way, quaint and sweet, he showed what it means to praise God, even when he seems most absent, to revel in this heavenly truth, even while the Lamb remains unseen. Rutherford, in his day, faced significant dangers a parish minister in Anwar, he was exiled from his parish for being outspoken about developments in Scotland, which won him few friends among the king's men, people who cared more for political power than the health of the church. Aberdeen, the place where he was exiled to, was the only town in Scotland who supported the Church of England. There, he was separated from the people he had worked so many years to serve, stripped of the influence which he had exerted, walking through a town full of men whose religion was more a political means to an end than a true faith. Yet Rutherford did not let this stop him from looking at the Lamb. He wrote to a friend, Our love to him should begin on earth, as it shall be in heaven. In other words, if we are to praise Christ for eternity, we had better begin now. As Paul put it, we are to set our minds on things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Rutherford practiced what he preached. Not only does his tremendous hymn, woven together from his quotations, The Sands of Time Are Sinking, point to Christ, his letters exude this fragrance. Listen to this. If I had as many angels' tongues as there have fallen drops of rain since the creation, or as there are leaves of trees in all the forests of the earth or stars in the heaven, to praise, yet my Lord Jesus would ever be behind me. That is, he would not have praised Christ enough. Or this, but the beauty of ten thousand thousand worlds of paradises like the Garden of Eden, all in one. But all trees, all flowers, all smells, all colors, all tastes, all joys, all sweetness, all loveliness in one. Oh, what a fair and excellent thing that would be. And yet, it would be less to the fair and dearest, well-beloved Christ than one drop of rain to all the seas, rivers, lakes, and fountains of ten thousand worlds. Surely that is the sentiment the angels are expressing. Is that ours? Heaven draws near. Soon our occupation will no longer be with the things of this world, but with the employment of heaven, perpetual praise, should we not prepare? Christ is the Lamb, the Lamb prefigured through biblical history. Should we not begin our praise now? If he is the Lamb caught in the thicket, 
if he is the sacrificial animal, if he is the one who is crushed and afflicted for our sakes, should not his name be constantly upon our lips? If John made it his work to say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, should not that be our work as well? Well, how do we prepare for this work? By doing precisely what we see here. Confessing our own unworthiness and the worthiness of Christ. This is to be our employment now and for eternity. Let us begin. Let us begin by gazing at the Lamb who is slain. Let us look to the cross. Upon the cross of Jesus, mine eyes at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me. And from my stricken heart with tears, two wonders I confess. The wonders of redeeming love and my unworthiness. Say that. Say it over and over again, day after day. And you will go through life with heaven on your lips until this brief time is past. And with all creation, we will sing. Worthy is the Lamb. Amen.